uh, first of all, you know, could you just quickly tell us, you know, what drives you to write this new book, you know, The High Wire uh, relating to China's tech regulation? Well, um, I have been an antitrust lawyer for uh, quite some time before I switched into academia. And my PhD is also specialized in antitrust law. So uh, my uh, initial academic work uh, focused primarily on antitrust enforcement, particularly uh, in China. And, and in 2021, I published my first book um, called Chinese Antitrust Exceptionalism. And this book couldn't come out at a better timing. Uh, if you may recall, China initiated a massive regulatory crackdown against uh, its biggest tech firms uh, like Alibaba um, and yes. and uh, starting from late 2020. And <clears throat> the, main, the main regulatory tool the government used is actually antitrust law, right? So there was a huge demand at that time among both the industry and the financial community, as well as the community understanding, you know, how is China going to Mm -hmm. uh, use applies antitrust law against its own biggest tech firms. So they all turn to me because I just published a new book. Um, and, and then start from then, um, because I got so many inquiries on a daily basis, I felt like I have been at the epicenter of this regulatory storm. And I realized that it didn't stop there. You know, it didn't just course, stop yeah. at Mars So essentially you started with uh, antitrust law analysis uh, on China's tech re regulation, but then you get into a book um, to, to cover broader regulatory topics for the tech yes. industries. Yes, because you saw that you know, the Chinese government actually expanded its toolkit to not just include antitrust, but later data regulation. There's a wide range of data laws that were introduced during the crackdown and also labor regulation. And we also need to consider how the tech firms themselves uh, uh, regulate and adapt to the government's regulation. So my book actually spent two chapters uh, and focused on uh, self-regulation and governance of these tech firms. And we also look ahead and, and try to predict how China will regulate tech in the future. Um, so this is a much bigger book. I mean, look, I mean, my second book is much yeah, bigger yeah. It, it is than, than the book. first book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah. I think most importantly, I think the most important contribution of this book, it, it creates an analytical framework for us to think about more generally how to regulate. Um, because, you yes. know, the law yeah. can so, change. So maybe you, the, you, yeah. you can uh, comment yeah. on your uh, framework. You know, it, it's called a pyramid model, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, exactly. No, the, the whole point of the dynamic pyramid model, the reason why I want to introduce it is because law is very fluid in China, right? Today they have the law, they may not enforce it, right? And and then tomorrow they might amend the law, right? So I want to give my readers something more uh, that can stand the test of time for us to think about how how China regulates and, and as well as to predict how China will regulate in the future. Right. And so that's why we, that was the whole point why I want to introduce a dynamic pyramid model. Now, this model basically uh, was inspired by the system uh, thinking, which sees our world as a very complex and interconnected system. OK, so basically I'm trying to explain things are very complicated when regulators yes. make a decision. And, and in this model, um, I, I basically um, explain, you know, the Chinese regulatory system is characterized by three main features. First is a hierarchy, which I use to describe the regulatory structure. Second is volatility, which I use to describe the regulatory process, which tends to be very volatile. Um, mm -hmm. And that gives people the impression that Chinese regulation could be very arbitrary, very unpredictable. And that leads me to, uh, this, to explain the third distinct uh, feature, which is fragility, right? In the sense that very often well-intentioned regulations can generate vast unintended consequences. And it often right. takes a long time for the policymakers to realize these consequences. And so it often led to you know, uh, irreparable damage. I see. You know, as, as a former lawyer uh, in China and the US, I, I, actually I did a past China bar many years ago. So, so I totally agree with your point about the complexity and uh, yes. uh, volatility, you know, because uh, last 20 yes. years, China did come up with a lot of more laws and regulations 
uh, and related enforcement actions, right? Uh, but the third point of fragility, right? Uh, it's 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 less less obvious, and I I I guess yeah. for a lot of readers, you know, they they probably will be keen to understand what does that mean. So could could you go a little further into fragility? Right, that's a very good point, right? I mean, yeah. so how do we evaluate at the resilience of a particular policy intervention? I, I look at it with a two, two dimensions. First is we look at, you know, what are the side effects from mm -hmm. the intervention? Just like taking the drug, right? I mean, it's supposed to uh, cure a particular disease, but it might generate unintended consequences, creating all these side effects. The other dimension we look at information lag. How long does it take for the top policymakers, um, the people at the very top to realize, you know, this is causing severe side effects and then we need to reverse course. Now, in the Chinese system, the regulatory system, what I identify is that it tends to generate um, strong side effects and no information lacks, right? I mean, so by the yeah. time yeah, yeah. So, so how about problem, some, some yeah. example? Some, you know, recently, last two, three years, right, China took a lot of new regulatory actions. You know, could you pick one particular, like a big impact action, and then you talk about the uh, regulatory measures and uh, the unintended consequences or the side effect in your words? Well, I mean, there are numerous examples, but the perfect example yes, that yeah, I yeah, elaborated yeah. In, in the book is the the the, COVID, uh, the, uh, the tech crackdown, right? I mean, this crackdown lasted for unprecedented 18 months. And, you know, I, I actually you know, have a lot of sympathy for yeah. the government's intervention because there was hardly any intervention in the past decade. And and then these tech firms has grown recklessly, and um and and it's create all sorts of antitrust uh, issues and data abuse issues, right? So I do sure. think that the government has strong reasons to intervene. However, the way they went about it created all sorts of problems and particularly generate huge market backlash. And mm -hmm. and you see companies like Alibaba and Tencent, they lost about fifty five to sixty to seventy five percent of the market cap during the crackdown. Right. I mean, so if you look at the top 10 Chinese tech firms right now, they are much weaker in terms of their size and scale uh, compared with what they were, you know, before the crackdown. Right. I mean, supposedly you the, the whole point of this antitrust intervention was to inject more, uh, trans, uh, you know, trying to inject more competition in the regul regulatory uh, landscape. Right? I mean, we want to and lower the entry barrier. We want to attract more uh, 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 new new players into the field, but because investors have retreated, right? They have left the Chinese market. They decided it's uninvestable. So, yeah. so there is even less new entry into the market, and we're not facilitating. And we're not, you know, facilitating any changes in the competitive landscape. And if anything, it just entrenched the the the, the dominance of the existing incumbents because they are the ones who are better able. To, to deal with a lot of the regulatory compliance, uh, wh whereas the smaller players will find it very difficult to do this. So now, ta talking about uh, you know big players and the, and the small players, right? You know maybe uh, I, I, we can offer another perspective to look at the uh, valuation drop of the big guys. You know maybe uh, their models have been mature, like e-commerce of uh, uh, of uh, Alibaba, uh, right? Obviously they they try to get into new sectors like cloud computing as well to find new drivers, et cetera. Um, yes. and, and now the latest obviously is AI, right? Um, yeah. So, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's hear your views on China's regulation on AI, uh, because uh, uh, globally, China probably is the first country to come up yes. with a AI regulation, you know, even though recently EU comes up with a more comprehensive AI regulation, right? So, so what, what do you think about China's AI policy and the regulatory actions so far. Right. I mean, Winston, you're absolutely right that China appears to be a pioneer in introducing some of the earliest and most comprehensive legislation on AI, right? I mean, if you may recall back in 2021, China already introduced a comprehensive set of measures to regulate alg a recommendation algorithm, like right? yes. algorithm that's powering TikTok yep. and, you know, and also the social media apps. And a year later, China introduced the regulation to uh to deep fake, and then and last year, last August, China became the first country in the world to have introduced a new set of rules to regulate generative AI. 
right? And then, by the way, China is the first country and the only country in the world have imposed a licensing requirement for uh, service providers to offer uh, of sensitive yeah. AI services yeah, to but the public. But this is not right? new I mean, in China, right, uh, Angela? Yeah, because in the, in the past, you know, relating to blockchain technologies and other similar technologies, they also introduced a registration system, you know, for new projects, yes. right, to, yes. to, to be registered yeah. at the yeah. national regulator's uh, website. Uh, so, 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 yeah. So, so, so the AI algorithm registration, right? It seems like a very quite a consistent, uh, in a, yes. in, in, a, in a peculiar way. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. So that gives people the impression that China appears to be very strict. Like, I mean, um, but what we, I observe is that we can't just look at it at the surface. And you're absolutely right that you know this kind of content moderation requirement is actually we can see a clear path dependence in the government's uh, regulation in the past. And in fact, whether you are looking at recommendation, uh, algorithm right, the legislation, or DFA regulation, or the genetic AI regulation, there's a strong emphasis on content moderation, which is the bottom line of the Chinese Communist Party because they want to maintain information control. However, when we look closely at the enforcement of the AI legislation, you will see that the government is actually quite lax, very lax, and primarily because of the institutional dynamics in China, because the government is truly vested in AI development, right? I mean, the government is simultaneously playing multiple roles in the AI ecosystem. It is a regulator, it's a policymaker, it is an investor, right? I mean, the supplier, sure. it's a customer, it's everywhere. It's all a at promoter once. too. So, mm. Yes, right? I mean, so the government led a very strong commitment to seriously regulate this technology. And if anything, you know, I, I sort of see a lot of Chinese AI legislation an enabler for the industry. And in fact, you know, the law yeah. contained a lot of encouraging language and trying to send very strong signal to the industry that they're going to adopt a very cautious and tolerant approach in with AI legislation. China is actually taking like, just like the man high wire uh, on the cover of my book, right? And so on the one hand, it is maintaining strict content moderation, information control, right? And we make sure that uh, the generative content is political aligned with the communist all these value. But on the other hand, it understand the enormous benefits that can be brought about by these technologies, right? So the government is also trying to enable the technology by sending very strong, friendly policy signal. It's a exactly. very, very yeah. delicate you know, balance. Obviously, it's interesting yeah. to, to see that China is the first country to start a AI regulation, but it is also the country probably is most determined to promote AI innovation in China. Uh, so, so I totally agree with you, you know, kind of mixed uh, roles uh, of Chinese government uh, in, in the tech sector, especially in the AI kind of context. Um, so, uh, you know, when we talk about AI, we cannot talk about, uh, uh, we cannot forget about data, right? Because data is the uh, oil of the, of the new AI economy. Um, so, so what about the data regulation, you know, all, all the related data training, data labeling, uh, data storage, data cybersecurity, so on and so forth. Uh, what, what do you feel uh, about China's data regulation, uh, especially in the uh, cross-border contest? Oh my God. I mean, this take, will take a, a long time to explain. We have, we've been through a whole drama with China's uh, data regulation. And as you know, you know, during the crackdown, China introduced the world's, one of the world's strictest data uh, law. I mean, the personal information protection law after it used GDPR, and in many ways, it's stricter than the GDPR. In fact, the highest penalty they can impose is 5% of the firm's revenue in the previous year, where GDPR only imposed 4%, up to 4%, right? I mean, and, and then later on, China introduced um, very stringent cross-border uh, transfer rules, which really annoy all the, a lot of the businesses operating in China, and in fact, cause some of the firm's to uh, decide to exit from the Chinese market because they think that, well, this thing, they, they have no idea how to comply. And it seems extremely cumbersome because this kind of cross-border data transfer is so routine in day transactions, right? I mean, just unthinkable that they need to obtain clearance from the, the cyberspace administration of China all the time. But then because of this market complaint, again, there is this big information lag problem. I mean, this complaint has lasted for a while, but it, it wasn't until 
late last year and all of this year, the China gradually began to unwind uh, these uh, uh, some of the, 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 the and relax some of the stringent cross border uh, data transfer rules. However, the damage has already been done. Right? I mean, th those farms who decide to exit the Chinese market, they have left. They have set the team. They have terminated. Right? I mean, so I personally just know of some. Uh, big U.S. banks that decided to shut down their entire trading uh, office in mainland China simply because of the data transfer issue, right? Yes. I mean, so um, yeah, yeah we, we, we certainly see that yeah. trend, right? But at the same time, you also have uh, Tesla expanding its uh, operation in China. Uh, how, how how should we understand that? You know, does that mean like, you know, is it, you know, for some foreign companies like Tesla, still find it okay, uh, uh, doable? to work with China's data and uh, tech regulation? Oh, of course, right? I mean, Tesla derived a very large percent of its revenue from the Chinese market. I mean, it's like over 20%, it's on top of my head, right? So China is a hugely important market for Tesla. And Tesla also incurred some uh, data issues, as you may recall, you know, Tesla's car was restricted uh, from uh, parking at a certain restricted areas like uh, you know, military uh, uh, compounds or government offices, right? I mean, so, but the Ch even for that, you know, the Chinese government have relaxed that when Elon Musk landed in Beijing uh, yes. a couple of weeks ago. And so um, you see, uh, you know, it, it, it's at least at, at this point, right? I mean, Tesla can't leave China and China is a hugely important market for Tesla. And there's ways for, for Tesla to uh, negotiate and bargain with Beijing. And by the way, Beijing also don't want to use, you know, create this data, uh, don't want data regulation to eventually become a trade barrier for Tesla because they want to demonstrate to the world that Chinese cars, Chinese EV should also be sold in other jurisdictions like Europe, like the United States, and data concern shouldn't be a trade barrier for these Chinese cars as well. Yes. Okay, very good point. So this is a great transition, you know, to, to into some discussion uh, about China's tech reg tech regulation in the U.S. China context, right? I, you know, as you know, you know, I I, I published a book on similar topics, uh, but the uh, similarly provocative title, the Digital War, you know, how China's tech power shapes the future of AI, blockchain, and cyberspace, right? So, so I want to mention this because I want to get your view uh, 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 about. Uh, China's tech regulation in the context of uh, the the rivalry between U.S. China, right? Um, I think you know because uh, uh, when you look at the China's tech tech re regulation, you know on one hand you can say they really try to control these Chinese companies, but at the same time uh, uh, they are also using the uh, tech uh, tech policies and the regulations right to 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 express their industry policy views, right? Essentially, they're yeah. driving um drive, driving the uh, the resources and the capital uh, uh into uh, uh in, in China into the sectors that they want to focus on right uh, so 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 you so you know in my book I talked about tech regulations uh, as a, a reflection of China's uh, tech policy shift which is uh, uh, consistent in your analysis in the book I'm very glad uh, uh, because in your book you also talked about China's tech regu regulation uh, uh in the context of China shifting its focus from soft tech like e-commerce, mobile entertainment, uh, a mobile payment, right, into hard tech, right, like art artificial intelligence, right. Uh, so, 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 I guess you know the, the question to you is uh, how 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 do you think about the uh, effectiveness of, of China's tech regulation in the context of uh, industry policy uh, uh, objectives? Again, I am not uh, that optimistic about the effectiveness of the government's uh, reorientation of the, the tech firm's um, uh, commercial strategy. And um, obviously, one of the consequences, as I discussed in the book, um, and as you also you know, uh, explain in your book, is that um, because of the crackdowns, my investors have flee from uh, the consumer businesses decided this is not an area that is investable more, right? I mean, and so so the money started to flow into the hard tech businesses, and uh, even including the tech firms themselves, like Alibaba and Tencent. These are the biggest corporate investment house in China, 
And then they have also passively invested a lot of money in hard tech as well in recent years, right? Mm. Before they used to buy a lot of consumer tech businesses um, and that's how they grow to be this enormous right. size. And now they have also pivoted uh, to uh, hard tech, right? Um, but because hard tech is not in their genes, so they only invest as a path uh, investors. And the government funds also flow into hard tech, private investors also flow into hard tech. But I think the problem, however, is that overall, the Chinese tech firm size have shrunk, right? I mean, these firms like Alibaba and Tencent, they're much smaller than they used to be. Alibaba at its peak was a firm worth $800 billion. Now it's a firm worth about $180 billion, right? I mean, it's a much smaller firm, while at the same time, the U.S. tech firms have grown enormously due to the AI boom in the last couple of years, right? I mean, NVIDIA, now one single company is worth all the top 10 tech firms combined in China, right? I mean, so at the, I, th I think that on the one hand, the chi Chinese government seems to use this tech crackdown as an opportunity uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to drive this industrial policy, to try to push its tech firms toward more hardcore, more foundational uh, tech developments. But at the same time, it un un in unintent like it, you know, uh, unfortunately, have also undermined the most dynamic tech sector and weakened the tech sector and crippled its I, most I your competitive point. businesses. You know, I, I see. I see, you, see your point. You know, uh, you know, as a tech investor, right? You know, I, <clears throat> you know, I, I would say size doesn't matter, <laughs> but I could offer like a, a, another big difference uh, last two, three years. Uh, aside from the tech regulation, you know, is the monetary policy. You know, China did not. Uh, did not uh, open the uh, spigot of the money printing, but the U.S. Uh, uh, cut the rate to zero and and it stayed stayed uh, uh, kind of stayed with the loose monetary policy for a long time. And that kind of uh, kind of monetary policy difference actually also is, is a factor, <clears throat> you know, for the for the tech companies' valuation uh, change last couple of years. But but that's a much longer story, and I just offer that. To, to for for more comprehensive kind of context, uh, but I think you you are right on you know about uh, the the impact the Chinese regulations impact on the Chinese tech companies right because uh, if the Chinese government wants to uh, uh, wants to be a leader in advanced technologies like AI then it it has to enable the Chinese companies right uh, so uh, so 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 maybe maybe you can quickly talk about. Uh, how Chinese companies are uh, reacting to this, and uh, can they find their competitiveness in the in this regulatory environment? Well, I mean, as an entrepreneur, if you if you are, we ask around, you know, the, the 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 Chinese business community these days, the crisis of confidence because of this zero crackdown, not just at the internet sector, but also the property sector. And there's, you know, prior to that, there was the the the, the uh, some of the policy missteps with co management, right? I mean, so the, so we in overall in the Chinese society, there's a crisis of confidence. I mean, these are the, also the unintended consequences resulting from this crackdown and and the policy enforcement. Um, like, I mean, so it's 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 hard. It is extremely fiercely competitive business in China, given all the economic slowdowns and and the, this kind of institutional environment, right? So entrepreneurs are trying very hard uh, to succeed and survive in the Chinese market. And that's why uh, many of them are looking for overseas opportunities, right? I mean, and that's why in the past few years, you see more and more Chinese firms like ByteDance, um, you know, Ping Duo Duo yes. and Shein, you know, these companies have started to uh, look overseas and they, they did phenomenally well and in, in recent years, particularly uh, conquering uh, the, the overseas consumer business market um, <laughs> because yes. this is something that they're really good at. And um, yeah. That's a very positive note, you know, like you know, talking about the, uh, the, the Chinese companies' uh, global expansion, right, in, in, in this uh, context. Uh, and this is perfect, you know, for for this event uh, at the uh, National Committee uh, on U.S.-China relations. Uh, so, so, so maybe as a closing uh, question, you know, uh, maybe you could quickly comment about the, uh, uh, the the Chinese company's global expansion and uh, 
uh, how this uh, China's uh, tech reg regulatory framework, uh, you know, like how how does the uh, the China tech regulation uh, framework right drives the the future U.S. China uh, tech competition or even uh, collaboration, if if we so wish. Right. I mean, I do think that Chinese tech firms are fairly competitive overseas, particularly in the consumer tech businesses. And but at the same time, because of the Chinese identity, as we all know, they're facing a lot of uh, legal challenges. Like when TikTok was facing the 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 ban or you know a divestiture um, a dilemma in the United States at the moment, right? However. These companies, they are very resilient, um, they are very adaptable, and they do know how to play the games uh, in different jurisdictions. And I, I have no doubt that TikTok will resort to uh, all sorts of legal strategies in order to continue to survive and thrive in the US market, right? I mean, as to how to my, uh, my analytical framework, which mostly apply to how China regulates tech um, because, because of its driven by China's distinct uh, regulatory system, how it might affect the size of U.S. tech rivalry. If anything, I think at, at least what we see, uh, you know, the immediate and the short-term impact is that China is actually unfortunately crippling its more competitive uh, tech firms, right? I mean, and uh, and and it's actually making them weaker uh, in in this in the Sino-U.S. tech rivalry, and particularly with the AI boom and given the U.S. very uh, aggressive. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, export restrictions uh, on and leading uh, on on the advanced AI chips to China, oh, and right. this has yet yeah, yeah, further uh, uh, undermined China's AI development. Right, I mean, so the gap between China, U.S. and China is currently widening, and, and there is a huge a lot of anxiety in Chinese business and the tech community about how we can stay competitive with the United States. Yes. Now, I, I, great that you mentioned about TikTok and the uh, AI chip sanctions and so forth, right? Because these are not only questions relating to China's tech regulations, but also the U.S. tech regulations. Yes. So, so when you settle in uh, USC at the West Coast, uh, we we should have another interview with you uh, to cover both China and, and the U.S. tech regulations. Mm -hmm.